Hey, we're live. We're live. Hey, Chris, why don't you start this time? I was going to say, Marcus Boyd in Wakahatchee, Florida. How the hell are you, Marcus? Well, Marcus I bet so, it, yeah. It's you, warmer there than it is here. I thought you were going to say calling Rick Beyer in Chicago. Oh, yeah, yeah but that was just a lead-in. So you want, you want me to say that? I do. Okay, calling Rick Beyer in Chicago. I'm here calling Chris Anderson in London. I'm here. Oh, excellent. How, how are things in Chicago? Uh, cold. cold. You could say, how cold is it? But it's very cold. It's not like a sunny Toronto, which is apparently warmer. Uh, maybe John can tell us how cold it is in Toronto. It was about zero Fahrenheit here today. Right. Uh, and um, John's looking forward to an interview about an emperor I've never heard of. You know, I, we should say we are talking about ancient Rome today. And the, the history happy hour empire, Chris... Yes. It, it is larger than the Roman Empire. It is. I mean, it extends from California. Yeah. We have listeners, viewers there to, to Spain and France. So, yeah. And we're like the, the twin consuls of the History Happy Hour Ooh. Empire. You'd look good in purple, Rick. I, I, you know, I was surprised that you didn't wear a toga today. So yeah, little, they don't. They don't. Terry cloth doesn't come that big. I see. I see. Very, very tough for you. It is. Uh, but uh, 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 we'll wait a minute for everybody to join us. And I want to remind people that we're here talking about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern time on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. Yes. And that all of our broadcasts, that is to say, all 45 of the history happy hours <laughs> that have happened so far. <laughs> Are available um, on the History Happy Hour webpage that you could do almost a two-day um, binge. binge and really get your History Happy Hour. So if you hour. didn't pay your Netflix bill and they've cut you off, yeah. you can binge History Happy this Hour thing. is here for you. Yeah. So uh, we're building up a few uh, viewers here, Chris. So you think we're ready to get going? I think we are. All right. Let's, let's have at it. <laughs> The bar is open. <clears throat> yes, and welcome everyone to the Super Bowl pregame edition of History Happy Hour. I'm here with color commentator Chris Anderson. Chris, we have a historic matchup today. Praetorian Guard, Ooh. you know, Roman soldiers, Ooh. emperors, all sorts of fascinating stuff. What do you think? I want to know what the halftime show is. Yeah, um, <laughs> our halftime show? That is uh, unbooked as of yet. <laughs> But uh, listen, our show today has almost nothing to do with the Super Bowl, but we'll try to Yay. find a connection before the hour is through. No. And uh, we're going to travel back in time uh, further than we ever have on this program. Uh, so do you have your time machine ready, Chris Anderson? I do. Okay. I do. So we're going to turn the clock back about 1,800 years to visit the Roman Empire of the second century. And our tour guide for this trip is going to be Simon Elliott. He's a historian and archaeologist, a historian, I mentioned that one already, yeah. author, uh, former editor at Jane's Defense uh, Weekly, uh, a PhD in archaeology, and a trustee of the Council for British Archaeology, which all sounds super, super impressive, it and does. I think actually is. And he is the author of a nine books, including the one we are talking about today, Pertinax, the Son of a Slave Who Became Emperor of Rome. So we want to welcome Simon Elliott. Simon, welcome from hey, Simon. Kent, hey guys. England. Thank you hey, for having me on. Hey, Simon, you know, with that introduction, you know, head of all this British archaeology thing, shouldn't you be wearing tweed or something? I just, I don't know. Well, I can go, I can go and get it, Chris. Shall I go and get it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or a deer stalker. Yes, exactly. A pipe, actually, a pipe would do. Actually, I, what I was going to volunteer to do, shall I read the, the title of this as Russell Crowe would have read it in Gladiator? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, so, so we'll go... Pertinax, the son of a slave who became the emperor of Rome. There you go. Oh, very good. That well is done. awesome. And and good. worth mentioning, as I was going to mention anyway, that this story actually takes place just at about the same time as the movie Gladiator, or right after it, starting about five minutes later, we, maybe we'd say. <laughs> well, during, I'm gonna, I'm, during and after. Well, firstly, Rick, I'm going to give you your, your Super Bowl link. Your Super Bowl link is very straightforward. It's the Colosseum, because one of the key characters in the story of this amazing individual, Pertinax, uh, is Commodus, played by Joaquin Phoenix in the movie Gladiator. Uh, Commodus was famous in the Roman world as the emperor who absolutely loved taking part 
in gladiatorial combat, all, albeit his opponents were drugged um, or, or injured in some way. And if he was in beast hunts, they were drugged as well, clearly because he's the emperor. But he did take part in gladiatorial combats in the Colosseum. Colosseum, Super Bowl, there's your link, boom. So it's, right. it's sort of as if, um, where am I going here? If Joe Biden was coming in as quarterback instead of Tom Brady. Yes. No, it's nothing like that. Oh, oh. <laughs> Boy, you lost me there, man. Just, whoop, whoop. I think we're all going. So I have long been interested in ancient Rome, and I have visited Roman ruins in such places as Rome. Uh, I've been in the UK, in Bath. When I was uh, 14 years old, I, I was with my school group from Birmingham and snuck away to the pub from the ruins in Bath and had my first Guinness Stout, so that's why archaeology always has a positive memory for me. Uh, fascinated by stories of all sorts of figures like Caesar and Nero and Constantine, and I gotta tell you, Simon, never until your book had I even heard of Pertinax. So tell me, who is he and why did you want to write about him? Well, the first thing is it's, it's one of those amazing stories in history where it's firstly an honor almost to be able to bring this character back to the attention of, of the world because in the Roman world, Pertinax was as famous as Julius Caesar or Augustus. He's this every man figure who truly was the son of a, a former slave who ended up through hard work, through being very Roman actually, through grit and determination, uh, becoming the Roman emperor. And then uh, he, he was only the emperor for three months. He was the first of the, the, the emperors of the year of the five emperors in 8193. And, and he stood up to the Praetorian Guard and eventually they assassinated him because he wanted to style himself as being uh, a worthy philo philosopher, philosopher emperor in the style of sort of Marcus Aurelius. Um, so um, his father uh, lived in Liguria, which is uh, north um, western Italy, and he used to be a slave. He was manumitted and freed. When he was freed, he ended up like like uh, a number of slaves, if if they 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 were lucky enough to to be a very successful businessman, and um, that enabled his son Pertinax, um, Publius Helvius Pertinax, to give him his full name, to receive a good education. Now, bizarrely, Pertinax being raised in um, a fairly wealthy household later in, let's say, his pre-teens, um, decided once he graduated from school at the age of 16 that he wasn't going to join the army, he wasn't going to do this or that, he wanted to become a teacher. So he was a teacher until his mid-30s. Wow. Um, and then he had this Damascene conversion moment where he decided he was going to join the military. Who knew? And um, through the uh, help of a family patron, um, joined the Roman military, then just through happen chance, happened to serve in the latter half of the second century AD, which is the time when the Roman Empire is at the height of its power. He served everywhere. He served on all the major battlefields. He served against the Parthians, who were the Persians in the east. He served in Britain twice, including being based in York, fought in Scotland. Yes, great. That's a great map actually. So if we'll start him off in northwestern Italy. And they will move him across to Syria. And they will move him up to Britain, uh, top left. Then move him really, really top left, top left to Hadr the line of Hadrian's Wall. He was based at Housted's Fort on Hadrian's Wall for a while, as well as York, Fort in Scotland. Then he came back to uh, the Danube and served uh, in what is now modern Romania or Bulgaria and was the captain of a fleet of ships. Then he served in Rome in charge of the grain supply in Rome. Remember, this is a guy who didn't start his proper career until his mid-30s, when all of his contemporaries had started their similar careers 15 years earlier. So he's playing catch-up from the very beginning of this step-up in his mid-30s. Then goes to become the admiral in charge of the Roman fleet on the Rhine. Then you get the gladiator moment, as in the movie. Because in gladiator, if I was to choose any of the individuals in gladiator to be Pertinax, it would probably be the Derek Jacobi figure, who's the very worthy individual who wants to keep sort of Roman values high. And um, Pertinax becomes a very successful general, fighting alongside the general who Russell Crowe plays, Maximus, who's a real figure so Pertinax fought alongside him in real life um, and then later becomes the governor in the key frontier provinces of the Roman Empire so the guy in charge just below the level of the emperor so he's in Syria he's in on the Danube again he's in North Africa then serves in Britain again as the governor <laughs> and while he's in Britain as the governor the legions rebel and try and kill him and he survives through the skin of his teeth his guards you, you got, are you, you, 
you got to stop for a minute here, Simon. And, and I'm nearly finished. Uh, Rick, Rick, I'm nearly finished. <laughs> I'm nearly <laughs> finished. This is a chance to ask a question. <laughs> no, I'm, ne- I'm nearly finished. So he serves in Britain. Then he's in Rome next as the Praetorian, is, is, in, is mm-hmm. the, the mayor, the, 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 the mayor of Rome when the Emperor Commodus dies and he gets appointed emperor. That's the story. No, you, but you're... you're no, whatever. <laughs> so, Chris, what are you going to ask about yeah, now? No, he's, I, he's sad at all. Well, wait, one of the, one of the questions I have... There's Perty Cracks. <laughs> there's Perty Cracks. <laughs> One of the questions I had, Simon, and I think maybe it would help some of our viewers, is if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of the nature of slavery in Rome. Because, I mean, most of our references are to more modern slavery, say, you know, in America before the Civil War. Um, and and that kind of slavery, um, you can be a, a, a black person, you can gain your freedom and be considered a free man, uh, but you're still black. And you still face those prejudices as you go through life. So, is Pertinax's father and family are they facing the same kind of prohibitions? Or, or once you're a free man, is that okay? You can go on from there. I mean, it just seems remarkable to me, you know, given his career. <clears throat> it's a great question. It's a great question. So, the first thing to understand is the nature, the structure of Roman society. So, in Roman society you have at the bottom, you have slaves, okay? And let's say in Italy, that's probably no more than 25% of the population at the very most, and, and going through to being only one in 10 in somewhere like Egypt. Then you have uh, freed men, who are men and women who are freed slaves. So slave, freed man. Then you have a free man, who's somebody who has never been a slave. Then above that, you have three classes of uh, aristocrats. You have the curial class, who are your merchants, your artisans. Then you have the equestrian class, and finally the senatorial class, who are the patricians. Anybody below the level of senator is a plebeian. Okay, that's where the word plebs comes from. So if we go back to, down towards, uh, as the Romans would see at the bottom of society, the slaves are the slaves. You can be manumitted through a variety of methods. You can earn money as a slave in Rome, so you could buy your freedom. You could perform good service and be freed by your master, uh, or you could be freed in your master's will. And once you're freed, you're a freed man. A freed man can do most things that, uh, that every, every other member of Roman society can do, except hold a number of key public officers. But everything else you can do. And what you tend to find is a lot of freed slaves, freed men, celebrate their lives because they can't um, hold very important public office through monuments so, so through huge mausolea through uh, funding the building of public buildings and that kind of thing okay. so it's sort of like you put putting their name on buildings as opposed to uh, being able to to be a, a consul or be a senator yeah exactly and th- th- that's the distinction between pertinax and his father his father was called helvius successus um, and we don't know how, uh, we don't know where he came from, so we don't know how he got to northwestern Italy. He could have come from anywhere in the, Ro- uh, anywhere in the Roman Empire as a slave. He could have been captured north of the Rhine or Danube. He could have been captured in the east. We don't know. Uh, but, but we find him, when his son is born, in northwestern Italy, in Liguria, or in the Po Valley, um, making money as a freed slave because he turns out to be a very, very good businessman. And so his son, probably in his later preteens and his teens, effectively gets the, the finest education uh, that you could give a child in the Roman Empire, and this is being paid for by a freed slave. To be clear, I'm not saying slavery is good. It is clearly awful. However, in the Roman Empire, there are certain ways out of it if you are lucky, and if you find your way out of it, you can make a success of your life as we would see it today. Right. So so then Pertinax, you know, his neighbors wouldn't have said, oh, look at him, he's a son of a slave. He's not quite, you know, he's, there's not that stigma attached to him, or is there? And I think that's, a, I, I, actually, Chris, that's, again, a really brilliant question, actually. Yeah, that's Chris's um, department, is the good questions. <laughs> that's, that's, that's his job. That's, I have a different job. That's his job. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, I, I think, I, my instincts are, well, look, look at, you can see, you can see, we can answer your question through the prism of what happened in his later life. One of the reasons I think he was successful later when he was uh, made a senator, much later in life, is because uh, he wasn't taken seriously. He, he basically submarined below everybody else and no one took him seriously until it was too late and he was the emperor. 
because he wasn't as wealthy as anybody else. Everybody would have known he was the son of a slave. Right. In his later life, he would have been acknowledged as a very, very, very brave soldier and a, an exponentially good military leader who was very, very popular with the public. The public nicknamed the most famous racehorse in Rome at the beginning of the AD 190s, Pertinax, because he was their favourite and the racehorse was their favourite. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because the people who were his rivals just didn't take him seriously. Now, you can see that written in his early life, almost certainly. Well, he clearly, within his social circle and his father's social circle, would have been known as the son of a slave. But it right. wasn't the blot on the copybook right, that would okay. stop him achieving in life. There's okay. a, a follow-up on that that comes from one of our, our viewers, uh, Nancy, who asks, how did a freed man rise in society? And I would, I would sort of add, build on this question. So not as he, only is he the son of a, of a former slave, as you've mentioned, he's somebody who gets a very late start in the quest for public office, the uh, cursus honorum, as it's called in, in Rome, the sort of the rising and the path to, uh, to power there. Um, and you've, you've documented sort of the, the stops on the road, but um, how did, how was that able to happen? And I know some of it might be conjecture, you know, was it, was it was there helping a hands along the way? Is he an extraordinarily smart man? Is he extraordinarily uh, pertinacious man, Ooh. as his name might suggest? You know, that's what, that's where his name comes from. His father named him pertinacious because he himself, his father, was known as a pertinacious man. So his father named his son after his own trait, which is this very Roman sense of grit this determination to achieve you know you set your mind to something and no matter what the adversity you keep going and keep going and keep going and and to answer the, qu the questions directly and again they're great questions uh but this one was from nancy so she that's also for <laughs> job is to do great questions also thank you very much for your great question nancy um i would say that if you are a free well two 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 answers firstly if you're a freed slave and you bought your freedom then you've got money because you keep the money um, and you, uh, you're, 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 you're talking about maybe the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of pounds today. So th clearly he's a very, very, very successful person in his own right, even as a slave, his father. But also, interestingly, in the chapter in the book where I talk about slavery, the second half of the chapter talks about patronage, which you touched on, Rick. Patronage is really, really important here in the Roman world because if it, uh, the, the family clearly had a, a wealthy patron uh, early in Pertinax's life, who looked after the family, including his father. And it's this patron, actually, who in his mid-30s is the person who arranges for Pertinax to join the military. This individual will clearly have been there for the last 10 or 20 years, making sure that at every step of the way um, that Pertinax's family were looked after. So there was a road to being successful already there, one through money and two through patronage. It's very normal. If you go to um, Pompeii or Herculaneum, any of the townhouses, you'll notice outside the townhouse, onto the pavement, overlooking the street, there'll be a bench, a stone bench. The bench is there for the people who are seeking patronage to sit on in the morning, waiting to be called into the tabulinium in the townhouse for the patron to have a chat with them, find out what they wanted, and then he tell them, this is the bit that off people often miss, what he wants in return, because it's a two-way street. <laughs> That's why they have benches out in front of your apartment building, Rick, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, Chris, tell me what, come tell me what you want anytime you want to. I, I have to, I, I, know, I, I know it's Chris's turn to ask, but I, I forgot something, and no one has noticed it, so I, I'm lucky I can jump in. I forgot to ask you, Chris, what your cocktail is today. Well, as comes no surprise, celebrating Scotland's victory over England in rugby, a nice single malt. Oh, <laughs> rugby. That's, that's the yes. one where they can pick up the ball, right? And they hit each other, and they don't have to wear pads. Oh, how lovely! How lovely. Simon, are you are you with us today? Are you drinking? Or are you being a, a sober? Uh, you know, are you the designated driver? I'm designated driver. I've got a diet coke. <laughs> designated only, historian. Only because I actually do want to watch the Super Bowl tonight. By the way, that's oh. just the designated historian. Oh, it's Super Bowl. And I want to say that I not only am I drinking Italian wine, but I think that's the Coliseum on the bottle. It is. Well, right? it's certainly it's, it's certainly an arena. Anyway, fantastic. <laughs> it's something, something something close to that. 
All right. I'm, I'm Are you done now? Enough of me for the moment. Okay, See, now you me. understand a little bit about my job, Simon. If Chris is to ask good questions, Martin yes. is to. So, Simon, Simon, Simon X is he's in his classroom one day. One of the kids throws an eraser at him. He throws up his hands and said, I'm done with this. I've had enough of you kids. I'm going to join the Army. Uh, he's coming late in life to this. It, and there was obviously, there's obviously, there's no West Point in ancient Rome. So how does he become a soldier? And what sort of training does he undergo to all of a sudden be leading other Roman soldiers? Well, he gets off on the wrong foot. So, so, oh, so, so, so number one, he's very late in life anyway. Number two, he, he wants to become a, a centurion, actually, in a legion. So in the Roman military of this phase of the empire, you've got two principal kinds of soldiers. You've got the legionary, who were the elite warriors of the ancient world, I would argue. And you've got uh, auxiliaries, who are still very good soldiers, but not quite as good as the, the legionaries. The legionaries are the guys that are on, on the front of all the books, wearing their banded iron armor, the lorica segmentata, and their Gallic helmets, and their scutum shields, and their pilums. So, so Pertinax wants to be one of these guys. He wants to be an officer in a legion. Uh, he wants to be a centurion. Um, now, most people think a centurion is an NCO, but a centurion is not. A centurion actually can be anything from an NCO all the way up to a very senior officer. Uh, so he wants to be a centurion in the Roman legion, and he doesn't get the gig because uh, his patron clearly doesn't have the clout to go the whole hog. So instead, he gets an appointment. Uh, bear in mind, this guy, you're almost going from one day teaching with a whiteboard today to the following day being on the front line in Syria. Well, that's um, what I mean, yeah. Because, because the, the unit he gets appointed to, which shows how cosmopolitan the Roman Empire is actually, is a, is a Gallic auxiliary cavalry unit. So he wants to be a legionary, a foot soldier in the, the legions, and he ends up being a cavalry officer as an auxiliary, and he gets posted with, to... With men from Gaul. When you say Gallic, you mean the, from, from, from what is now France, from Gaul. Yeah, the, uni the, the unit was recruited in, in Gaul. We, know, we, we actually do have the name of the unit. It was recruited in Gaul. Um, one of the key things about Pertinax's life is, is up to about two-thirds of the way along in his career, he erected a, a, a memorial to his success called the Brill Inscription, which lists all the, the appointments he had. So we actually know most of his appointments through the way that he would have styled it. So he, he joins this unit of Gallic cavalry, who, by the way, were headhunters. Gallic and German cavalry in the Roman military tended to be headhunters because of their 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 forebears were headhunters. So they so helped actually... people find jobs, or <laughs> not that kind of headhunter. Very very oh. very special very special jobs. Very right? special very, jobs. Very, very, <laughs> very special jobs where you you you, you basically get get uh, uh, sent to Hades. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Travel so included. Yeah. yeah. So so he gets appointed, but clearly they're in the east in Syria, and he's not. So he has to travel to join them. So he uses the Roman trunk road network uh, to get to his unit in Syria. And he arrives in Antioch, um, modern Antakya, on the border between Turkey and Syria today, and presents his credentials to the governor, who's the big guy. You know, the governor is the emperor's representative. And uh, it turns out he has, he's not got the paperwork to actually have used the trunk roads. So he turns up effectively illegally in front of the governor. So the governor, listen, just really, cause I think this is amazing detail, which is which is in the primary sources and it's cross-referenced three times in the primary sources the governor to punish him makes him walk on foot from the mediterranean coast of syria to what is effectively the modern border of syria and iraq to join his unit so so that's how his career begins so so he starts late and then does does it completely the wrong way but here's the kicker it turns out he's a natural so he yeah. fights in his first war is called the Roman Parthian War from AD 161 to 165. Parthia is effectively modern um, eastern Iraq, uh, sorry, eastern Syria and, and Iraq, later becomes the Sassanid Persian Empire. And it's the nearest thing the Romans have got at this time to what we would call today a symmetrical enemy. So an opponent who can give the Romans a run for their money. Remember Crassus, famously killed at the Battle of Carre by the Parthians. Um, but he makes his name, he proves the natural. Well, that's that's kind of, um, I mean, following up on Chris's question, that is kind of hard, I think, for us today to imagine. I, I am over 35, although I know I don't look it. But uh, I can imagine, I can't imagine when I was 35 and I was working as a, uh, a creative director at an ad agency that I decided one day 
that I'm going to be a soldier and you know a couple of weeks later I'm leading uh, a US Army regiment someplace and doing a great job I mean I I, I would imagine that I would completely fail and um, be immediately killed by the enemy or my own men so uh, so how, how I mean again I know that the information is probably not there but but how do you think he he pulls that off I mean is it enough just to say he's a natural? I mean, uh, or or is there is there more sort of broad training of people in Rome at this time to sort of prepare them for this? Well, the very the, I mean, clearly the Roman military were exceptionally well trained. But even over, so he, he would have had very good training. He would not have been put in charge of a unit of, of, of men. And bear bear in mind these are these are seasoned warriors. You know, they're 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 um, headhunters. They they a, basically okay. they chop they chop the heads off their opponents when they defeat them. Um, and, and so these are tough guys. Uh, so Pertinax rocks up, and 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 again, I'm just going to show you the book. Not, I'm not plugging the book now. I'm just showing you. The, I, I want you to look at his features, right? So that that is a rugged guy. Okay, you know he's a tough guy. This is later in life when he's in his early sixties. So even as a younger man, this is going to be a tough. That's a great great image, tough guy. By the way, as an aside, guys, do you know why you so often see a Medusa on the front of Roman armor? No. Oh, no. Because in the pre, well, in the, uh, in the in the Roman world, there was very little understanding of public health. They knew things were bad for you, but they didn't know why. And one of the things they believed was that you could use the evil eye, i.e., look at somebody, to curse somebody or infect them with something just by looking at them with evil intent. So to deflect it, what you deploy are countermeasures, chaff and flares. And the chaff and flares of the Roman world with the evil eye are other eyes. And what does a Medusa have? A Medusa yeah, has a head full of snakes with loads and loads of eyes. So very often you find on the front of very fine Roman armor, they have a Medusa's head to basically divert the evil eye of your opponent. But that guy there is a tough guy, right? And and clearly he made a huge impression. He must have been brave. He must have been a good leader of men in battle. He must have had something about him which, which his superiors picked up on. Because his next appointment goes from um, one hotspot in the empire to the other. And I'll give, I'll give you an example. The Roman poet Horace, writing around the turn of the first century BC, first century AD, talking about Augustus, says, Augustus will only be a god if he defeats the pesky Parthians and the pesky Britons. And of course, Augustus didn't. So Pertinax goes from defeating the pesky Parthians to defeating the pesky or fighting the pesky Britons um, within probably two years of him signing up. And, and he does oh, yeah. become a god. So there you go. He is deified after, he, after his he, death. Uh, now, Simon, are there, and this is going to tie in, we've been getting some questions about sources, um, but is there anything in the sources, is there any description of him as a, of a, of a man saying, you know, he's, he's impetuous, he's brave, he's smart, he's big, he's tall, or is it, is it this bust we have of him and your kind of analysis of the, the primary sources that are giving us what we know about him? The, 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 the word that comes out over and over and over and over again when the primary sources talk about him is that he is worthy. So the reason why the Romans loved him and the reason why um, anybody looking at how to be a good ruler in subsequent generations likes Pertinax as an example is because he is genuinely one of these worthy figures of history that's achieved what he's achieved through grit and determination and he clearly has lucky breaks but he knows how to make the most of them that's one of the key things you find with successful people in history they know when they've been lucky and they know how to make use of the luck well he's clearly one of them um, but he's worthy and, and, and that's a great way to segue into the sourcing as well so like most of the emperors of this period, the key sources are going to be Dio, who's, who's okay as a Roman historian, Herodian, who is uh, notoriously flaky, and then the anonymous Historia Augusta. But between the three of them, and then later Latin sources, which reference works which have now been lost, you can produce a fairly reasonable um, uh, career plan for Pertinax, especially his later life, because in the book, the thing that I found the most fun was to talk about the last two or three years of his life, because it almost becomes like a sort of a historical soap opera almost, because you, saw, you, you see him starting to play at the very top with the, the very mad and bad Commodus. I mean, whacking Phoenix's Commodus, the portrayal, not the history, but the portrayals, I think it's very accurate. I think he genuinely was 
the real deal, mad and bad Commodus. Um, to the extent where, when Marcus Aurelius died in AD 180, he left about 40 aristocrats who were to, to be mentors for Commodus. And by the time Commodus is assassinated on New Year's Eve, AD 192, literally the only one left is Pertinax. Well, you know, um, and I want to get to that, and I'm sure Chris does too, to the last couple of years, but I want to ask a question before that. Um, <laughs> there is a movie, not Gladiator, there is a movie called A Million Ways to Die in the West. And reading your book, <laughs> it struck me that there's a million ways to die as a high-ranking Roman official. You, It's a really murderous time. You could be murdered by your own legions, a rebellious uprising, neighboring tribes, uh, orders from Rome, poisoned by your wife, your girlfriend, your sister-in-law. It, it's not like being the head of the FDA, let's say, or head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, these days. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's like that. Uh, it's a pretty high wire life these guys lead, and and Pertinax has his own uh, episode, which which you mentioned, but you can f feel free to describe it a little more detail. Uh, well before he's emperor, you can. In, in actual fact, I mean, what well, all of that is absolutely true. Um, in fits and starts, so you'll have a period of 10, 20 years of relative peace and then a turmoil of um, changeover of, of the emperor or the advisors to the emperor. Very often it's actually the advisors to the emperor who are causing the problems. The only, the, uh, the, the, the only time you have it, the whole thing going on for decades is in the crisis of the third century from AD 235 when Alexander Severus, who's the last of the Severan emperors, uh, is assassinated to... Diocletian becoming the emperor in AD 284. But before that, it's in fits and starts. And clearly there's a big fit and start around the time of Commodus assassination. If you're in Rome, at least you can see it coming, okay? Imagine what it must be like, and this is relevant to Pertinax, imagine what it must be like in the provinces. Let's say you're in a far-flung province like Britain, and let's say you're a noble family and there's a usurpation takes place in Rome that you don't know about. And word reaches your family in the Medway Valley where I live or uh, north of the River Thames where you are, Chris. And we're in our fine villas. Well, I'm in, I'm in my hovel on the on the River Medway. Chris, you're <laughs> yes. in your, Chris, you're yes. in your huge, huge, huge um, country villa, villa estate. And word yes. reaches you that the emperor is dead. Long live the new guy. Who are you going to back? Because it may be the following day word arrives to say the new guy is also dead. Who are you going to back? And so I'm going to so check forth. my vineyards. And <laughs> that's a good idea, actually. I, can't, I, I, can, I, can't, I think I can be your bailiff. The, um, the, 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 the thing to remember there is that there's a direct correlation between Roman coin hoards and these changes taking place, especially in Britain and the Northwest. You tend to find coin hoards appear when there's a changeover and people are, are, are fearful of backing the wrong guy. So they'll bury their portable wealth so that if the existing guy survives, they can go back oh, to it. And yeah. if not, they can melt it. Now, the fact that the coin hordes still exist today means they did back the wrong horse because they didn't go back <laughs> to get there. Get, <laughs> and, and, and Pertinax is relevant here as well. There's a beautiful Roman villa, which you may know, of, Chris, uh, in, in Western Kent called Lullingston, mm -hmm. which is very fine. It's famous because it's got amazing scenes of early Christian worship. But before that, it was famous for also having a nymphaeum, so a sort of a mythological... Uh, place of worship and um, it's so fine it's thought to have been the summer residence for the Roman governors of Britain now remember Pertinax was the governor of Britain in AD 185 to 186 yeah when Lullingston was excavated they found two buried defaced heads from statues in one of the basements bricked up so not only were they defaced they were bricked up to hide them and it turns out the statues were of Pertinax and his father. So either at the time he was governor, I remember the legions tried to kill him, or later when he was the emperor, when the Praetorian Guard did kill him, either of those occasions could have been the reason why whoever was living there thought, hold on, better, <laughs> better just make sure I'm not backing the wrong guy here. Let's yeah. go. And also the way they actually defaced the statues, it was really crap, if I may say so, because all they did was knock the nose off. They didn't knock yeah. anything else off. They didn't chip anything off. They just knocked the nose off, bricked it up, forgot about it. Until the, and, and they're now in the British Museum. The beauty is they're so unproposed, unpresupposing when you're walking around the British Museum, you'll go around and say, oh, that's interesting, and carry on. 
And yet this is one of the most important figures who actually existed in British history, actually. Um, and here's the thing. I'm going to bet that the people who did this, they kept the noses in a drawer. Just in <laughs> case. Right? And they had a little mortar. Oh, Pertinax wasn't killed. And you're putting the nose back on, right? And, right? And, then they have, and then they have guests who come to their house. Let's say the noses are in the spare room in a desk. And the guest opens the desk and goes... <laughs> That's really weird. Uh, yeah. This is <laughs> this guy this collects is, noses. If you put this scene in the next movie you write, Simon, uh, about Pertinax, uh, yeah. I am suing your pants off. <laughs> I've got to tell you, I've got, I've, I've got to tell you guys. Actually, this is the first book I've written where I've actually had Hollywood in touch with me to talk about the the, the film rights. Best of so luck that, to you. So, and, and the interesting thing is, you mentioned it at the very, very uh, start of the conversation, Rick, that. Um, Pertinax's effect that his story is directly linked to the story of Gladiator because, of course, when Commodus dies, the person who is the emperor after Commodus. So, if you'd have gone on five more minutes after Russell Crowe died at the end of Gladiator, the guy who becomes the emperor is Pertinax. Right. So, so Simon, we talked a little bit about um, his military career, his, his upbringing, but one of the things that is it's also remarkable about him is he's a very clearly a very competent soldier, but he's also a pretty competent administrator. Can you talk a little bit about some 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 of these government positions he has before he becomes emperor? Well, the first posting that he has as in a civilian postings between being um, a squadron commander on the Danube and the admiral of the fleet on the Rhine. So in between those, that's a very big career change step. Okay, that's huge. So the role he has in between them has got to be a big gig because he's got to really prove his worth. To become the admiral of a Roman fleet, you get appointed by the emperor, which means whichever gig he had between the two, he actually attracted the attention of the emperor. And it looks like the gig he had was to be the guy in charge of the Cura and Nona, which is the grain supply of Rome. So remember in ancient Rome, the citizens had this free grain dole um, which was vital to the city being peaceable and quiet and everybody behaving, because if they didn't get the free food, they'd be writing in the streets, literally writing in the streets. So to be the guy in charge of the Cura Anona grain supply was a huge job. And he did it. And again, this is the amazing thing. Um, probably only a decade, 12 years, after he uh, just immediately finished being a teacher. You know, it's an absolutely astonishing career path. And yet... Having tested it to breaking point, it's all as far as I can see true. That's amazing. And, 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 and are there any sources? Has anybody anything that you come across that you know of just Romans anywhere talking about this guy Pertinax? He's he's everywhere. I mean, he must have been famous even then as this guy who's just he's like a universal soldier. He's an administrator. He's he's all over the place. And yet, again, it's almost like uh, he disappears from history, doesn't he? At the end, if you go through to, so if, if you were living in uh, the Western Empire in 81, uh, 476, <clears throat> when the Western Empire fell and, and you were a Roman citizen, you'd have known the name Pertinax. If you were living in the Eastern Empire all the way through to AD 1453 uh, with the final sack of Constantinople, you'd have known the name Pertinax. If you had any Roman lineage in terms of history, you'd have known the name. But once you go beyond that period, it's one of the names that drops off history. Um, it's occasionally referenced, so the founding fathers actually in, in the States reference Pertinax as somebody almost too worthy, actually, because he was so worthy, he ended up being assassinated. So they were trying to learn from his mistake, quite a crucial mistake, because <laughs> <laughs> it cost because it cost him his life. But the uh, but 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 other than that, it's just one of these figures that drops off from history. And until I, I came across the guy writing my biography of Septimius Severus, uh, which is a through the prism of Severus's campaigns in Scotland, which, by the way, were the largest ever military campaigning forces ever deployed in Britain, 50,000 men. Um, and, and Pertinax came to me through that research because Pertinax was the mentor of Severus. Um, so when Severus becomes the legate of Legio III Scythica in Syria, the governor of Syria at the time is Pertinax. When 
Severus becomes the governor of his first province, Gallia Lugdunensis, which is the middle bit of Gaul. Uh, the governor of the the, the, the the frontier province across the channel is in Britain is Pertinax. And of course, it's Severus, and we'll talk about it later, I dare say, who then descends um, like an avenging angel on Rome and the Senate after Pertinax's assassination, eventually becoming the emperor at the end of AD 193. And he's the guy who deifies Pertinax. You know, I, I, I want to... I, I, I was planning, and I am still planning, on asking to taking us to the night that uh, Pertinax finds out that uh, they want him to be emperor, which is a great story all by itself. But uh, one of our viewers, uh, Xavier, puts up a quick question here, maybe worthy of a quick answer. Uh, how did the Roman Empire survive some of these emperors? Because they, I mean, Pertinax was a good one. Commodus was a bad one. There were other bad ones, too. And yet, how did they manage to do century after century of hanging on? If we were to look at uh, what's happened in modern politics, whatever one's views on both sides of the Atlantic in the last five or six years, you could take the view that providing you have a decent administrative structure, which I, I think in the UK and the US we do, then, then you're fit to survive the most turbulent of times. Uh, that's certainly the case in Rome because... You, I mean, you can you, you could pick. I, I, I could talk all night about the mad and bad emperors: Nero, mad; uh, Caracalla, bad; Commodus, mad and bad, uh, and and anything in between. Uh, look at the year of the. Uh, look at the Christ of the third century when you have multiple usurpations all the time. You know, Roman Britain was most famous in the Roman Empire for being the place where where people try to take the purple. Uh, especially in the later empire, the only one who succeeded was one of the most important Roman emperors, Constantine. But many tried it, uh, and yet the system survived. And it, it took it took uh, a structural failure of such proportions towards the end of the fifth century that nothing could have survived it to bring down the empire in the west. But even then, the empire in the, the east survived for another thousand years. So the system worked, and it could survive the mad the bad and the mad and the bad and hopefully there were none that were sad because that would have, really, <laughs> that would have been tough to survive okay oh um, but but let's go let's go to uh because let's not miss out on on the good stuff here let's go to the the night uh uh that um that uh our our, our man pertinax finds out that the the power brokers here want him to be emperor what happens uh, and 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 the great scene in the bedroom, which is just a great scene. I'm going to I'm going to read I'm, I'm going to read you the, uh, the the quote actually from Herodian. Basically, New Year's Eve, AD 192, AD 193, um, Commodus is assassinated, and he's assassinated by a troika featuring the Praetorian prefect Laetus, the uh, court chamberlain Eclectus, and his own mistress Marcia three of the most powerful people actually in Rome at the time and they've decided they had enough of Commodus because he's basically taking everything to rack and ruin. He's bankrupt of the imperial treasury, that's a fact. So so, so they have to get rid of him, he's got to go. So they try and poison him and it's it's New Year's Eve and there's no Praetorian guards around, everyone's having a good time. But so is Commodus, he's been having a good time, drinking a lot and then he's poisoned with some sweetmeats by Marcia and just at the point he eats the sweetmeats he goes and has a bath a Roman bath, and he sweats the poison out. So instead of dying, he just is sick. But these are these are really well organised uh, assassins because they have it's, a wrestler. It's always good to have a backup plan. <laughs> and and that, their their backup plan is, is to have a wrestler. They've got a wrestler ready. We've all got as, as you would, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the wrestler strangles Commodus, and he's dead. So so they're casting around who should we uh, have to steady the ship. This is, by the way, where the JFK quote in the Times article comes from because people looked at Pertinax as being a source of hope to, to go away from the bad times to the good times. So they cast around who should they go for. They go for the Praetorium. They go for the, the city mayor, the urban prefect who's, who's um, Pertinax. Whether he was in on the plot or not, we don't know. Uh, I probably don't think he was. Um, certainly if you look at the responses. So the court chamberlain and the Praetorian prefect go to Pertinax's house, probably about a quarter of a mile from the Forum Romanum, middle of the night, revelry all around, people boozing, it's New Year's Eve. Uh, if the Romans could have had fireworks, they'd have had fireworks. They didn't, but that's the kind of gig we're talking about. Every revelry you can imagine. The, they knock on his door and his bailiff answers the door and basically everybody thinks that they're to assassinate Pertinax and Herodian puts these words 
in Pertinax's mouth as the court chamberlain and the Praetorian prefect go and see him in the middle of the night out of the blue. Quote from Herodian. For a long time now, I have been waiting for my life to end in this fashion. I was surprised that Commodus was so slow to act against me, the sole survivor of the advisors of his father who appointed him. Why do you delay? You will be carrying out your orders. I will be relieved from degrading hope and constant fear. So he thinks he's going to get whacked, basically. And ha having, having just watched the, the new cut of The Godfather Part 3, it's basically like the end of The Godfather Part 3. Um, so, so, so latest, the Praetorian Prefect responds thus. Please stop saying these things, unworthy of you and your past conduct. Our visit does not concern your death, but our safety and the safety of the Roman Empire. The tyrant is dead, victim of a fate he richly deserved. What he planned to do to us, we have done to him. We have come to place the empire in your hands, aware that you are not only the most distinguished senator because of your moderate life, there you go, and have won reverence for your greatness and the dignity of your years, but also enjoy the love and the esteem of the people. There you go. So he's made the emperor. Now, the, the next bit is my favorite piece of the whole story. And one of the things I'm really fortunate to do is to be a, a guide lecturer for, for a tour company called Andante Travels in the Mediterranean. And I do this as part of my tour of the Forum Romanum. He walks down to the Forum Romanum in the middle of the night through all the revelry. Nobody knows he's been made the emperor, probably just with two or three bodyguards. Latest, the Praetorian prefect's gone to prepare things in the Praetorian camp because he needs their support. The court chamberlain's gone to prepare the, um, the imperial palace on the Palatine Hill. So he's basically on his own, effectively. Walks down to the Senate house and sends word for the senators to come and see him and acclaim him in the early morning in the Senate house, the Curia, <clears throat> which is at the head of the Forum Romanum. And then he tries to go into the Senate house to get things ready, and it's locked. <laughs> <laughs> Just been made the emperor and he can't get in the senate because it's locked not only that the bailiff with the keys is out on the lash because it's new year's eve so they can't find him so he basically goes to the temple next door the temple of concord in the middle of the night just with some street lights or whatever torches here and there sits on his own on the steps for about four hours the most powerful man in his known world can't get into the senate house because it's locked and the bailiff's enjoying new year's eve so he sits on the steps for the Temple of Concord to wait for the keys to arrive four hours later. Oh, if, if you're not friends with the maintenance guy, you know, it, it's, it's all over. And before I, I go to Chris for the next question, I just want to say one of the things that that scene really reminded me of, and I guess maybe this is a deep dive into Civil War history, but when General George Meade is appointed to head the Union Army, it's in 1863 during the middle of the Civil War, the American Civil War. It's a very similar scene. Someone comes into his tent uh, and, and he believes that he is being arrested, that he's being put under arrest by Congress and being dragged away. And they're like, no, no, we want you to... Even uh, worse. <laughs> Right. Yeah, right. it was. You're in charge. <laughs> right. So, uh, so you know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. So, 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 so he, um, he eventually, you know, gets the key, so to speak. Um, he's made emperor, and I don't want to get into what happens to him quite yet, but he's obviously he's emperor for a very short period of time. What, if anything, is he able to accomplish as emperor? And does he enact anything or do anything that either A, stands out, or B, lasts beyond him? Effectively, what he does is he, he, he has a very, very populist agenda. He's very, very aware of his own roots. He's aware of the, the uh, unfairness of aspects of Roman society, certainly aware of the huge, uh, huge um, disparity in the distribution of wealth in the Roman Empire between uh, most of the wealth in the empire is in the hands of um, probably 0.001% of society. So what he does is he has this very populist program of, of um, selling unused publicly owned land at cheap prices to those from the normal citizenry who would wish to farm it because the land's going unused. So that's very popular. He, he, he literally walk, physically, physically walks into the imperial treasury to find it empty. So you can imagine that this is, um, this is like Smaug's lair at the, uh, the, the, the beginning of um, the third movie, The Hobbit, or in the book about halfway through The Hobbit. And 
he's expecting it to be stacked with gold to the rafters and it's not it's bare because Commodus has spent everything on lavish entertainment wow. so so he has a fire sale <laughs> <laughs> basically he turfs everything out of the Palatine Hill Palace that Commodus bought and has a fire sale literally he sells his slaves okay he uh, he uh, makes redundant any of uh, Commodus's freed men or free men who he's got no use for uh, he sells all of Commodus's clothes so there's a very vivid description in Dio about these amazing outfits that Commodus had bought you know there's green velvet there's a there's a gladiator outfit and all this and he sells all that he sells Commodus's collection get this of specifically built mechanical coaches so in these coaches Commodus would have sat on a seat which would have followed the sun around as he travelled, sort of a mechanical device, that kind of thing. So basically, he 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 partially refills the the, the fiscus treasury, and that's where his downfall comes from because he's unwilling to spend money when he doesn't think it's necessary. And and so then he runs afoul of the Praetorian Guard, and I mean that's a phrase that we all have heard. The Praetorian Guard. It's usually used metaphorically to describe people close to power or the attendance of the president or prime minister. But what, what does it mean? What is the Praetorian Guard and, and how does he run afoul of them? I, I certainly wouldn't have a Praetorian Guard. I, I, I know oh, that I behind that door, behind that door, who knows what is there? In fact, behind your shoulder, I think you do have a Praetorian Guard right there. No, it's actually Hector the Golden Doodle. There he is. Oh, there oh hey, Hector. Uh, there he is. That's my Praetorian Guard. The um, so the Praetorian Guard are literally the 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 the, it's the Imperial Guard, um, which is a formalization of the close bodyguards which a Republican military leader would have had. Um, Caesar's Tenth Legion, for example, could be called a sort of a proto Praetorian Guard because that was effectively his personal legion. Very big though it was. The Praetorian Guard into the Imperial period, the Principate Empire, um, half the time is good and half the time is bad. If it's good, they're elite soldiery. So Praetorian Guards accompany Trajan on his conquests in Dacia and in the East. If they're bad, they kill the Emperor. Uh, Pertinax is the best example of it. Um, and in fact, actually, I mean, when we talk about what happens after Pertinax's death, bring me on to what Severus does to the Praetorian Guard. But to give you a sense, it's very, really, really easy to give you a sense of what happens. What happens to um, to, to Pertinax with the guard? They want some money. He agrees to give them a donative, so a bribe, to cement the fact that he's become the emperor. So their boss, the prefect Lightus, makes him the emperor. Then after the event, Lightus thinks, "Oh, hold on a minute. I better go and ask the guards if they agree as well." And and they do agree, but they're a little bit wary of Pertinax. They're wary because he is a very worthy individual and a gifted and brave soldier who is famous for it, and they're not. Because the Praetorian Guard of the time of Commodus were basically sort of having living the good life in, in, in Rome. Um, so they're wary of him, and actually Pertinax in a speech to them to say thank you uses military phrases which to them are very jarring because it shows that he's the real deal, and it's basically saying they're not. I don't think he's meaning to do so, but that's how they take it. So they get off to a bad start. And Pertinax clearly thinks that he's got the wherewithal to manage this. So he agrees to pay them a partial sum of the one they want. And he may have paid it or may not, but he certainly doesn't pay him all they want. So at the end of month one, end of January, they come and see him. They say, can you pay us some money? And he says, no, I'm a worthy emperor. We're bust. I'll see what I can do later. But no. At the end of month two, this is when he's beginning his program of reforms and the public love him. They come and see him and they say, uh, we really, really want that money. And he says, no. And they say, well, if you don't, we're going to kill you. And he still says, no, because I'm styling myself on the very worthy Marcus Aurelius, the great philosopher emperor. And he, they go away and he thinks he's dealt with it. And then at the end of month three, they come back. But when they come back, it's really interesting because we get some major... It's the, it's the last few months of his life we get real detail, which actually would make an amazing movie, actually. Because the Praetorian... The, the way it's described, the Praetorian unit, which goes down to talk to him in month three, from 
um, the Praetorian camp, which is outside the walls of Rome, by the way, um, are in full armour. And they're not meant to be in armour, and they're not meant to wear weapons in, in Rome. But they're in full armour, they're kitted up, they're tooled up. What's more, they're in a military formation. They're described as being in a coenus, which means swine head, which is the battle line piercing formation that legionaries and auxiliaries use in battle against other heavy infantry. So you have the legion leading centurion on the, on the, on the apex and then like that punch through. Uh, and I think what's been described here is the legionaries having to fight, force their way through the crowds in Rome who are fans of Pertinax because they know that there's something afoot because the Praetorians aren't meant to wear armour and weapons in Rome. And they arrive in the Forum Romanum, they climb up the hill, which is steep, as you all know, in, to, to the Palatine Hill, to the Imperial Palace. And they're admitted into the palace by the freedmen of Commodus, now serving Pertinax, because the freedmen of Commodus think that they're going to get made redundant too. So they want to get rid of Pertinax. So they're let in. Now Pertinax sees them and goes to speak to them. And he could, he's got his own close bodyguard of Germans, doesn't call them. There's also a counterbalancing bodyguard unit of cavalry to counterbalance the uh, Praetorian Guard, doesn't call those either. He could have called the cohort of Barney, who are the gendarmes in Rome, doesn't call those either. He thinks he can face them down. And he stands up to them, there's probably about 40 or 50. And he faces up to them and he wins them over. He shames them, effectively, except one guy. Right at the end, the guy stabs him with a spear. And then after that, everybody else joins in. And I think that this is the guy that's been nominated by whoever is organising the plot to make sure that if everything else fails, this time he's got to go. You know, He's got to go, he's got to go. And he's dead three months in for being a worthy guy. Now, the criticism that he has later in other historical interpretations is that he's too worthy and he's lacking in common sense. Uh, because there's no way on earth that the emperor of the Roman Empire, uh, who, who, who in his world is the most important man on the planet, in his world, should be going to face anybody without a close bodyguard at least. And the close bodyguard would have been much better warriors, certainly, than that generation of Praetorian guards. So he's got this incredible. He's got this incredible life. He he kind of gets to the top of the greasy pole and it's amazing how quickly <laughs> it all just stops. I mean, his, his, his rise is incredible. And then just bam. Chris is buried uh, that night. He's buried that night. He's actually buried in a family mausoleum that night. So he goes from breathing, being the most important man in the world to having his corpse chucked into the corner of a, f a family tomb where they weren't expecting him to be buried. He should have been buried in a fine tomb somewhere. So, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to. So, so now, what happens then? So, with, you know, the chaos again, <clears throat> or minus an emperor again, kind of quickly, I guess. What 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 happens to Rome and what happens to to him? The Praetorian Guard have a very low point then, the low point then assassinated the Emperor, the guard they're meant to protect, because they auction the throne. They auction the, the, the Emperor's clothes, as it were, and they do it from the Praetorian camp. And the two individuals who are bidding are the person who was taken over from Pertinax as the city prefect, his father-in-law. Pertinax's father-in-law is bidding his son-in-law's throne. Now his son-in-law's dead, which is a bit harsh. Uh, and also a very, very dodgy senator called Didius Julianus. And Didius Julianus basically gives the Praetorian God all the money they want. <clears throat> Didius Julianus then becomes the emperor even more briefly than um, Pertinax. <clears throat> Severus, at the time, Septimius Severus, who's a great warrior emperor when he becomes the emperor. He's a great warrior. A also fought in the Marcomannic Wars with Maximus and with Pertinax. Um, he's on the Danube with five crack legions. So he's in the charge of the most elite units of the Roman military. And he drops like a sword of Damocles down to the Forum Romanum. A month later, he's there, bivouacked in the Forum Romanum, walks into the Senate House, point of a sword. I'm the boss. Didius Julianus is dead. Severus is then the emperor from AD uh, 193 to AD 211, when he dies in York, actually. <clears throat> and um, Severus is the guy who deifies... Pertinax. And is it okay, Ricky, if I just mention 
how that takes place because it's a beautiful story. Sure. <laughs> beautiful story. The uh, so, clear, clear, so so towards the end of the year, Severus wants to wants to give a fitting burial to his mentor Pertinax. Clearly, he can't bury him because he's buried already. He's been putrefying for because uh, he clearly wasn't embalmed if he was buried the night he was killed. So he's been putrefying for months. So he's, there's nothing there to bury really. So, so, so what they do is they have a state funeral, um, which begins with five days of fighting and etc. in the Colosseum, then parades of the military through the Forum Romanum to the camps of camp, uh, 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 the fields of Mars, and then there's a ceremony where you you end up with sort of rows of seating. All the senators are there, huge funeral pyre, and on top of the funeral pyre is the body of Pertinax, except it's not; it's a wax effigy. So, so there's this lifelike wax effigy of Pertinax atop this funeral pyre, above which sits a cage with an eagle in it, a live eagle. And what happens is Severus performs the rites, sets fire to the, the funeral pyre, the flames lick higher, just at the point where the eagle's getting a bit worried, they open the cage and the eagle flies away to heaven. And that's oh, Pertinax's soul, soul being deified, going to heaven. Uh, I, I can't even believe that we managed to get this whole life into this hour. But uh, uh, Simon Elliott, um, you know, what a great introduction to the Super Bowl today. So, <laughs> no, it was uh, it was fabulous to hear from you about Pertinax and your passion and enthusiasm are uh, definitely contagious. And we should mention one more time that your book, uh, which oh, you've waved at you. us a few times, is Pertinax, the son of a slave who became... Roman Emperor and Simon Elliott. Next time we want to talk about Rome, we want you to come back and talk to us about oh, it. Man. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so well. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking with you guys. Thank right. you. I really appreciate well, it. It was enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Simon. Good luck. Be well. May you have good dice rolls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, and we didn't even get to ask him about Indiana Jones, but uh, we'll, have, we'll have to save that for another time. Um, Indiana Jones, the worst archaeologist of all time. Um, and uh, But next week, Chris, we I just want to mention before we go, we're running a little bit over, that we are going to have, we have a very interesting show. We're going to uh, talk to author Philippe Sands about his new book, Ratline, The Exalted Life and Mysterious Death of a Nazi, Nazi, Nazi. fugitive, Nazi. Uh, and, and what it really is, is kind of an uncomfortably close-up portrait of a high-ranking Nazi official in occupied Poland who's indicted for war crimes but escapes uh, at least for a while. Sort of. Sort of. So, and and it, I think maybe it's worth mentioning that the author, Philippe Sands, was a friend of Jean Le Carré, yes. uh, who recently passed away. And John Le Carré uh, saw this book before he died and called it hypnotic, shocking, and unputdownable, hmm. which is good because we have to both read it this week. Yeah, so right. <laughs> I think that's a real positive uh, recommendation. Yes, it is. So I think that. What do you think? Does that does that wrap up another I think happy I, hour? I'm empty. So yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe.